Welcome to the Icelandic Broadcasting Corporation. This will be only sent in Icelandic. Okay, no problem. <laughs> you will translate later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Before we leave, uh, if you have time next week, we could have a quick run through of the whole course where we look at the home exam test and combine them. What day is the best, most suitable if we drop Thursday because that's a day off in Norway? Normal, normal on Wednesday. Wednesday? Wednesday. So I'll find a room not later than 11.15. I think we, we saw for Erasmus, I saw the, the transportation yeah. course is cancelled yeah. for yeah. the next week. Okay. So all, all the day. for us it's no, no problem all the day. So depending on our other colleagues. Uh, we got all by select until 12 on one space. So till 12? <laughs> so 0, 9, 15 to 11, 59 is okay? <laughs> That's so it's we work from 10 to 12, and then we work from 5 to 6. But we talked about it before, because she said that she had to learn her hands. It was very designed to be obligatory, because it was designed to be obligatory. And she said that she could learn her hands. And she said that she could learn her hands. Okay. Make ready for the next option. 12.01. Till 14.02, two hours, with short break in between. Okay, is that enough? If not, you can send me an email. Very good. For those interested in fishing, I still do fish. I still catch fish. So now I have fresh fish in my refrigerator <laughs> and the freezer too. So if you want to taste it, I already got one piece you can try. But then Johannes will make it, I think. After the, okay, after, after the, the lecture next Wednesday, we serve fish. Okay, fish it, fish it on Monday and serve it on Wednesday. Okay. He will um, come up with a French dish with white fish, and it's supposed to be very good, isn't it? Okay, good, okay. Then we can go into the last chapter, chapter 22, and when we finish here, we've been through all of the textbook that is part of the curriculum, okay? Nothing missing, <laughs> then we can go on, okay? This ends a course that started in January, where we were talking about developed countries. So out of all those chapters, one is left for the developing countries. So that is the major topic today. But let's do as we always do, rerun quickly through chapter 21, which was the last one. Why are money so important when it comes to trade? Is simply we pay for what we trade. We do not barter. So the development has been very quick the last hundred years compared to the last thousand years. For those of you who remember, Norway started as a trading nation on the west coast with no Vikings, and we bartered. We got things from up north, which is now Russia, brought them down to west, which is United Kingdom, and sold it 
to those who could afford it and got back things we needed. And that reminds me of the start of this course. Why do country export? They have to import what they don't uh, produce by their own. Yeah. So if they are not Dutch or Norwegian, they trade for or are in the between operators. So that was the start of it. Okay. So with money, it's much easier. If they have the same currency, even more easier or easier than any nothing else. So that is the start of it. So we need a system that can move money between countries so they can trade. And that was the major gospel of chapter 21. You can trade services or goods. You can trade now and pay later. We call that intertemporal. It means over time. But the third one is you can trade asset by asset. So there are several forms of trade. So asset by asset simply means that I want to be an owner of a house in the US. But I don't want to own it myself. So I let my company, which I established yesterday, to pay for the house in the US. So I have an asset, which is a company here, that buys an asset over there, which is a house that you can sell at a later point of time. Had this been in 2005, stay away from my firm. But since this is after 2009, it must or might be safer. Why do we need financial markets? And the answer is even simpler. Somebody has to handle or have to handle the risk. Because investment in future, as a production, is not certain or risky. So we need to handle risk. The other one is to spread the risk on different, let's say, assets. We call it portfolio diversification. And we mentioned, for those of you with a very good memory, because it's 14 days ago, it was waste of Norway producing oil and gas, or uh, at least selling, to buy the Swedish Volvo company for one reason. The risk of car production is the opposite of selling petrol. So therefore, that is one sort of diversification. Okay? The other one is if we are Norwegians, we sell knitwear. So if we own a car producing company, knitwear can be a very good diversification because it has nothing to do with car production. Well, <coughs> if you have a convertible and drive out on sunny spring days when it's minus six outside, you also need knitwear, but that is very seldom linked to each other. So these are the two major uh, reasons why we use uh, this financial market to get what we call a portfolio diversification. Either where the risk is the opposite, so it goes up, what comes down, and so on, or where there are no links between them. <coughs> and then it is also debt instruments. And this we call the financial crisis, but don't mention it to Krugman out there. The most well known for you, I guess, Financial institutions are banks. Or do any of you have your loans from Volkswagen or Peugeot or the Norwegian State Oil Company? But that could be an alternative. So big companies have a lot of money that they want to invest because they have too much of it. Then we have what we call governmental agency, and ask the Norwegian, they know what it is. Staten Slånekasse. <coughs> insurance companies. Why do insurance companies want to lend out their money? You never thought of it. Most insurance company has one wish in their life, to avoid pay for damages. 
And as long as they do not pay for damages, they have a lot of money. And therefore, they can invest or lend them out. Uh, pension and mutual funds is what owns the Norwegian pipeline network. In the North Sea now, it's Canadian because it gives stable income, unlike other investments. And then we have hedge funds. And those of you with a very good memory had heard of the fruit company. <coughs> and the DOS system developer, which was funded by hedge funds in California, in Silicon Valley. Because there were a lot of technolo technology advanced companies there. They had a lot of good ideas. Can you survive by good ideas? When you got the money. If you get the money, yeah. So if all of you have very good ideas, for instance, go fishing, you can survive if you can do something out of it. But very often you need money. So that is the problem. So therefore, hedge funds was a way to link a lot of money to a lot of good ideas. And if these ideas did not be successful, all of them, it was enough successful ideas to make this a profitable business. And if you don't believe me, ask who are among the richest persons on this earth right now, and you can probably link them to those, those two companies, can't you? For those of you who knows about them. Okay? Are bank failures a newly invented system in the US in 2008, in October? No. Has been there for a long time. So bank failures has been there. But they couldn't handle it, like they did in Iceland. And the two French guys who have been to Iceland know all about the, the Icelandic bank failures in 2008 and 9. So during the fish meal next Tuesday, no Wednesday, they will tell you about it. So bank failures can be handled different from the way they did it in the US. OK? What do you need to avoid them? Is, if you ask me, a very simple question, need a very simple answer, and that is examinations and restrictions. So go into the bank system. Check if they are, let's say, operating within a regulatory regime that you can accept. And don't let them invest in housing markets in the US. Because in a country where you split the bank from the investment uh, company, things are much safer. They didn't do that in the US. So they get ended up with bailouts. And if you ask somebody who has been to Iceland, they won't know what bailouts are. They only know about the terrorist regime of UK just after the crisis broke up in Iceland. OK? The final question in chapter 21 is, has or have the international and financial markets done its job? Yeah, for most of the periods, for most of the countries, the answer is yes. Because they have been able to allocate capital and handle risk. And that is the major uh, task of a bank or financial system. Handle risk and uh, supplying capital for those who need it. but it can be more stable. So when we meet in, was it 15 years? Is your own chair? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you are, at that time, the bank regulatory regime head in France or Germany. We can discuss what you did the 15 years in between to help uh, sort the system out so it became more stable. So unstable markets will always be there. It's a question of handling it.
Okay? It has helped consumers. For instance, incoming students. So they don't end up begging in the street, but they can pay their food with their money. So yes, consumers, investors. I think most of you would agree after 15 years it was a good investment, so you, it has also helped the investors. And no doubt countries. Some countries suffer just now, but that is another question. So our welfare level right now is probably generated by a well-functioning bank or capital or financial system. It has also made it easier to spread information around. Then we are almost into chapter 22. You might have heard of a place called Japan. You might even know where it is. You might know a little bit of its history. Okay. What happened to Japan in 1945? Yes, and they, I think they destroyed almost as much infrastructure as they did in Germany at the same time a little bit earlier that year. So they more or less destroyed buildings, factories, all of this. <coughs> Some think this was an advantage, not when it happened, not to those getting killed, but for the future economy, it might have helped. Because what do you need if there is no building there? Is build a new one. Is it easier to produce in a new factory compared to an old factory? And the answer is probably yes. So it might have helped them trigger their economy. But the most important thing in Japan in 19 was access to information. And I drive that information on four wheels almost every day because it is a Japanese produced private car. They copied the information of producing cars from US. Was it a success? Yeah, I would think so. They did so in Sweden, but they had their own version. Compared to Sweden, Japanese car producers are getting better off now than in Sweden, aren't they? Yes. So yes, information, transformation, or transfer of information is important to develop an economy. So Japan has become, in a period, number two. Now they step down to number three. It sounds like a Norwegian skier called Petter which was very good at the last Olympics, but now stepped down. So the Japanese economy expanded by transfer of information and access to money in an international capital market and wouldn't have been a success without them. <coughs> so for all we know, between all of you now, sits a person with a very good idea, which in 15 years have produced the best wheelchair ever for people over 70 that they can operate on their own just by the voice. See you in the wheelchair in 10 years time from now. Would it be profitable? No doubt. Would it be uh, easy to sell? If you ask me, not you, I think the answer is yes. So capital or money is needed to buy something now and pay for it later or invest money now to get the money back later. So it is what we call intertemporal transfer of values. So, influenced by money supply, 
by national outputs, which we call normally GDP, don't we? Yeah. And what is fiscal variables? Has nothing to do with fisheries. Almost it sounds like it is in Norwegian. What is a fiscal variable? GS sounds like a car brand, doesn't it? Citroën GS. But it is government spending. So that is what the money comes from. The government and they spend it to, let's say, influence economy. That is one fiscal variable. So one is government spending. What is then T? It's not T Ford. Taxes. So these are the two major uh, fiscal variables. So we can more or less uh, manipulate the economy by using either taxes or government spending. So that is fiscal variable. So next time you wake up close to a shop where they sell fish, don't go and ask for a fiscal variable if you want to shrimp, because that is something different. Okay? And in Iceland, the shrimps are gray before they boil them. And you know what dysfunctional is, don't you? It simply means not functioning. And if you want an example, we say, cross over the Atlantic Ocean, let it be October 2008, and it is an American bank that goes bankrupt. then it's not functioning. It has to be operated. So that is most probably it. Okay? So then there are two more conclusions. Trade gains by functioning uh, capital markets. And who benefits from trade? All countries involved. This was, I think, the conclusion of chapter two because I think chapter one was an introduction, but as soon as we came into, let's say, the textbook theories, comparative advantage, Nobel is ringing, but you have heard of it. No, okay. Then you will hear of it next Wednesday. Okay, and consumers and investors gain by a system where they can get access to money because if they do not have the money, they can borrow it. Those who lend it will then later get the money back. If not, you have invested in American housing in 2007. And they're not able to sell it till October 2008. As they had not done on Iceland but they still survive. So if you wonder if a country can go bankrupt, Iceland would be a candidate. Was it bankrupt? A few years ago. Almost bankrupt. Yeah. yeah. But since they still exist, not completely. Okay? So working of financial markets add to the trade generation. And since it's trade, countries benefits from it. Maybe the most important one is what we, for those of you with a very good memory, cultural multi cultural which simply means that if you were a Norwegian in 1969 and somebody offered you a pizza they wouldn't know what it is. If you in 1975 said, do you want a pizza or taco? They would look at you and say, what is that? I prefer my grandiosa. And so they did for 30 years. Now, if you see somebody eating grandiosa, stay away because they lost touch 10 years ago. So yes, this has in fact made us let's say, better off, because 
it is a welfare gain that we can increase our consumption. For instance, of Italian food, but since Fabio has left us, of German food even, but may God forbid, not English food. <laughs> if you've been there, you know what I mean. So the more opportunities, the better off we are, simply because we can choose. So on Monday, it's fish. On Tuesday, it's fish soup. On Wednesday, it is re-boiled fish soup with extra fish in. That sounds a little bit, let's say, not too much welfare in, doesn't it? So we want to have choices. And this has given us more choices, more products, more trade, gives us a better life measured by welfare. OK? So as long as this helps trade, it's good for all of us. So if you meet Krugman one day before you arrive back to the wheelchair meeting here in Molde, he will tell you still, trade will benefit us all. So as long as this improves the condition for trade, it is to the best for us. Not all within the country, but for the country as a whole, yes. So what is Actually, the major focus of the last part of textbook is what can reduce trade? What can hinder trade? What can make trade more troublesome? And then we are into the developing world. Because not all of the countries in this world will be, let's say, uh, estimated to be a developed area, but being under development. These are the, right now the five most well-known developing countries. They have surpassed NIC. So let's start with NIC. South Korea? Yes. Malaysia? Singapore? Yeah. So these are four of them. They were what BRICS is now, the fastest developing, developing countries in the world. South Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, Singapore. Because they opened up the economy, made reforms, and suddenly they started to grow. Now it is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. No. Now China is number two, Japan is number three. That's the biggest economy in the world. So they have developed very fast. So let's look into all these five, but drop three of them, two of them immediately. Not because they are involved in Crimea. Not because they are... One, two, three. Brazil, China... Yeah, India comes later. Because India is the example of the textbook. And India is a very special country. I think it was in 1947, long before your grandfather was born, or at the age. Okay. What happened in India in 1947? Became yes. And India has a large population of, let's say, original people living there, what the American calls indigenous. And if you are in Australia, 
the aboriginals, those who were there from the mm. beginning. So some things that to have a large population of, let's say, natives, it can cause problems for the development. And India is the answer that no, it need not be. So forget all about what is needed for uh, de <coughs> development when we come to India. So India is at the end. But OK, let's start with China. <coughs> and what do you know about China is that it is a very big country, but not the biggest. But they have the largest population competing with India. But I think uh, still China is bigger. But I mean, if there are more than a billion people living there, and you have to count every of them, they all have to stand still for many days to do it. And that is the problem for registration of people living there, simply because you don't know they are there. And you cannot find them when you try to count them. So one, it's a big country with the largest population, that is China. What do you know about Brazil? It's in South America. It's the largest country in South America. It has less than a billion inhabitants. But the history of the two countries is a little bit different. Do you know who ruled China in 1912? It used to be an emperor. But around 1912, there was a revolution in China. So that was the first revolution in China. So they got rid of the emperor. Has there been any emperor in Brazil? No. But have they been a colony? Yes. Or who was the colonist? Portugal. Portugal. Has China been a colony? Only occupied by Japan. <coughs> but most of the time has been an independent nation. So yes, they are different. Then what about South Africa? Was a colony till the turn of last century when there was a rebel and the English were thrown out and in came the Dutch, which they called the Boer, and they took over. Uh, are there many white people in South Africa? Not very many. Most of them are black. But it was ruled by a white national party till 1994, when they got a new president who had been in jail for 30 years because he was accused for the riots in Sharpeville, where the police shot, I think it was 27 or 28 demonstrants. And then he came into power in a general election where all South African that are allowed to vote. So the democracy background is also different. Would you call China a democracy? No. no. But would you call Brazil a democracy? More than China. More than China. Much more than China. But it used to be run by militaries, <coughs> simply because it was a coup and a coup and a coup in a period, which simply meant that it was run by the militaries. So all three countries have very different background, but they are developing <coughs> and have probably the same potentiality. Okay? China is the longest. Uh, the paper you read on now could have been produced in China 2,000 years ago, I think. The Germans think that the printing was, uh, the technology was developed in Germany. Well, a sort of in Germany, but they still could print things earlier in China. So China has a very long history. They have a lot of dynasties. I think it's called Meng and King and Wang and Wong and something like that, but there are a lot of them. So they have been a, an independent nation much longer than Brazil and South Africa. 
It was taken over by the Communist Party in 1949. We all know his name, the chairman from 1949 to 1976, because it's an abbreviation in Norwegian. And it was called Mao. Uh, Brazil is the second largest measured in area. So it's larger than South Africa. If you ask me, they have more natural resources than South Africa too. What about China? Do they have a lot of natural resources in China? Yes, yeah, some, but not enough. So if you wonder why there are so many Chinese companies in Africa, the answer is very simple. We need the natural resources we do not have back home. So the answer is the most uh, Afghan when it comes to natural resources is Brazil then South Africa, and then China. Uh, do you know what kind of natural resources that South Africa is known for worldwide? Iron ore. Yeah. Diamonds and gold. You can still dig gold in former uh, areas where they were digging down ground. Now they can dig it in huge heaps. We call this improved technology, but that's a different story. Okay, what is Brazil known for? Yeah. And the largest rainforest. rainforest in the world, I think. So they have a lot of trees. Okay. Uh, they can use it for something, but not for too much. Uh, Part of the rainforest is also in the neighboring country to the west. So I think it is in Bolivia too. I'm not sure where the borders are between. So yes, the youngest is South Africa. Became independent with a majority vote in 1994. But even before uh, South Africa was <coughs> run by the Boers, I think Brazil had its independence. So. Longest history China, second longest is Brazil, and youngest is South Africa. They have natural resources, so they have a growth potential. So far, so good. Okay. If you had the choice to decide where to go now, and I will fix you the tickets, which of the countries would you go to? of these three. Depending what Yeah. Let's say uh, to get a job. Why not South Africa? Because they are even worse than Greece. For some areas in South Africa, the unemployment rate is 50%. So if you are, let's say, an average South African, the chance to get a job is 50%. Then it's better to go to China. Okay? But why would I go to Brazil? And? 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 I think the potential is higher. Simply because there's not so many living in Brazil compared to China. And the natural resources potential is higher in Brazil. So if you don't find me here, call my agent in Sao Paulo, because he's taking care of my money, which is the biggest uh, urban area in South America and in Brazil. So if you don't find me here, just call my contact person in Sao Paulo and he will tell, me, he'll tell you where I am. And to tell you, I'm not in Natal. And you don't know where it is. To the northeast in Brazil, on the, just where the country bends back again. There are a lot of Norwegians there. And they are criminal back home in Norway. So if you are there and you are Norwegian and you have a quarrel, that's the end of story. 
So there is a Norwegian book about the newly rich uh, in Norway, which start with the murder in Natal. So don't ask for my address in Natal. I'm not there. Okay, but I think potential is better in Brazil compared to all of the others. <coughs> the problem for development has been lack of money. Most of these economies do not have enough money. How do they get it? Normally by inter international financial institutions. Have you heard of Argentina? I think you write it like that. Where is it? Neighbor of Brazil, South America, known for one thing. Falkland War. And they almost went bankrupt. They rejected to pay back the money they had borrowed. And that is the problem of a developing country. If you need money and do not pay it back, you run into problems. Argentina used to be the fastest growing economy in South America in the 30s and 40s. They were selling meat. Why on earth do they sell meat from Argentina? Simply because they have highlands with a lot of grass, but the temperature is perfect for growing cattle. So when you wanted a very good beef, you had to call Argentina because they had the best meat at that time. So yes, it used to be, but now not functioning because they are not able to fund their activity locally or nationally and lended money and rejected to pay it back. So why don't you go to a local bank, let's say in Peru, and ask for money? There are not enough money in the economy. They need more to develop. <coughs> so it must be a financial working system, call it bank or financial institution, it need also to be a political functioning system. And then you will look at me and say, did you say China was a democracy? No, but I said they have a political functioning system. So you need not have, let's say, democracy. But that, we'll come back to it later, is that okay? Yeah. But if the system, the political system is well functioning, you can survive. Did they survive in South Africa? Not at the end, but they started very good, till there was a boycott action. So I think uh, international boycotts against the political regime that they are not very happy with can lead to diff difficulties. But normally, South Africa had a well-functioning political system. Only a few percent were allowed to vote, but the system was functioning for a very long period. The problem is political instability. And then you will think of Hungary, don't you? Not at all? Okay, you're trying to think of Hungary. Okay, but you can say if the system is well functioning, it can be okay. If you ask me, I will look at Turkey, uh, but we can discuss that during a break. But I think Turkey is now running into problems because the system might be uh, a little bit troublesome in working or operation. Okay? Default simply means you don't pay what you owe somebody. So that is when you come back to Germany, finish your studies, do not get any work, are still working with the idea of voice uh, steering system for wheelchairs, you might run into problems, but promise me one thing then. Don't reject to payback. Ask to payback later. That's the best solution. And some of you have heard of corruption. A few places. That you haven't been to yet. Okay, I'll give you two, uh, let's say, uh, travel tips if you want to go to a place where you can find, let's say, suitable amount of corruption, one could be go to Angola. Do you know where it is? 
used to be a Portuguese colony once, then you can get a lot of it. We don't mention any European countries, but that was one. Corruption simply means that the political system is operating as long as you have money. And I think if you ask one of the American economists, they would think of the American system to be not corrupt in that sense, but who decides in the Senate? The senators. How are they elected? Some would say with the help of money. And then you are getting closer to what we in Angola would call corruption. They don't call it that in US, but there might be corruption also other places. If you ask me, and you are a Norwegian company, I will give you also another address, where they now have changed their political system. But they used to have a guy living in a tent in the desert in the northern Africa, who produced or um, came up with a lot of gas and oil. And his title was Colonel Gaddafi. So it has been opportunities to, let's say, test out the corruption in different areas. So now we have mentioned two African nations, but it could be much more. So corruption is a problem for the system to work. Okay. Uh, do you know where Ulan Bator is? It's a capital. Mongolia? Yeah. Would you call that developed? No. But it's the neighbor of China which is developed. So there are no single geographical area where you can generate the development. So before the break, we can conclude with one thing already. Development is not a function of geography. Okay? Because if it was, then Mongolia would be developing like China. Do they? And the answer is no. Then you would say, uh, what are Mongolia most known for? It's a huge area of desert. It's almost like Libya when it comes to area where you can live. Okay? So, Development is not a function of geography. So that was number one. And since we have three lecture hours, I will come up with another reason why it, you cannot link development neither to geography nor north. Okay? So remind me at the end of next lecture that I come up with number two. So far so good. 15 minutes means 12, 13, 13, 18. Is that okay? Then I have my lunch. <laughs>